first uh, speaker this morning is uh, Graham Barty, who is the Acting Executive Director, International Operations Group for Austrade. And as you can see from your program, Graham's got a, a lot of experience in both the commercial and the um, trade negotiation uh, sphere and, and a long background in, in dealing with a whole range of uh, trade related issues, uh, both at government and private industry levels. So please welcome our first speaker this morning, Graham Barty. Uh, thanks very much, Mick, and it's a great pleasure for both myself and for Austrade to be here this morning, and uh, I also believe in sticking to time, so we'll go. Um, Austrade, of course, is about market entry. Justin Brown is going to talk about market access and some of the fantastic work that DFAT's been doing in our trade policy negotiations. What I'd like to do this morning is actually give you an overview of what Austrade is seeing globally and how we see you being presented and packaged and what we believe the opportunities are. So that's really the aim for me this morning. Firstly, there are a lot of global trends occurring, whilst a lot of you are focusing on about population sizes of 9 billion. Actually, there are some other really big drivers occurring. Uh, that includes urbanisation. Uh, by 2020, there will be 40 mega regions around the world. A mega region is 100 million people or more in, uh, in one basic co-location. Mega regions and urbanisation uh, cause a number of impacts. First of all, it affects food distribution. Secondly, it takes existing agricultural land. And thirdly, it makes great demands on water and energy and other requirements to live in an urban environment. All of those things will impinge on the ability for current local producers in those urban environments to continue producing. In other words, they're inexorably being drawn towards a situation where they actually have to supplant their, uh, their, their food supplies. And of course, we've seen both a shift to Asia and the Middle East, the new Silk Road, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And of course, the new UAE air hub in the, in the World Trade Air Hub based just outside of Dubai and before Abu Dhabi. Uh, two major new global trade routes being formed. And of course, uh, technological change, what's called cyber physical space or global value change, all being run digitally means that we can now access markets <coughs> in ways that we've never been able to access before. So maybe a little bit controversial, I'd like to put some thoughts in your head. If Kodak's reason d'etre they decided was memories and not film or cameras, then what's agriculture's reason d'etre? Well, it can only be two in my view. It's about uh, food for life, food for living, or it's food for a lifestyle. They're, they're the only two reasons that we're producing and consuming food. Sustain my life or sustain my lifestyle. And I think it's really important that you understand where you fit into that and what we're trying to achieve. The important point I'll put down the bottom is Kodak was a world leader in film and in cameras for forever until it failed to adjust to the market change. The challenge for the Australian agricultural industry is to make sure we don't have our own Kodak moment as the opportunity comes before us. So we talk a lot about us being safe and nutritious food and having great um, safety systems and the like, but you know, we're not alone in that. So we need to be careful here that we're thinking that we're the only ones that can provide this capability. Without going into great detail in the survey, it shows that other markets are considered to be safe and friendly as well, the US market and, and also the New Zealand market. So it's not something that we have on our own. So that in itself isn't enough to differentiate ourselves. We have to find another way to actually uh, drive that. <coughs> the other thing that we need to understand, and Mick touched on this slightly, is we are but a small player, spread thinly across diverse categories in markets. And if you look on that particular chart there, you can barely find where Australia fits in that chart. It's certainly not the largest provider of food within the region, and it's only one of many. So in other words, we're not actually dominating one market, and we're not a dominant player in any market or in any capability. We're but a player in the global market, and we have a lot of competition. So we have to be mindful of that competition and what that competition is providing. The really important thing here is uh, competitive threat. I think this chart is a little bit of a worry because what it shows is that we're basically standing still. That for all of the things that we talk about, the opportunities and the growth in, uh, in Asia in particular, or globally, but certainly in Asia, we're not gaining in market share. And in that particular graph there, you can see that actually Brazil took $11 billion worth of business away from us. That was $11 billion of business with goods that we could have had 
with goods that, and, uh, and product that we could supply that, that we've lost. Now, what would be more worrying is if we continue to lose market share or not gain market share as the total volume of produce grows. So that's something I think we need to be concerned about. It's just not going to happen for us. We're going to have to work for it. I know a lot of you have been involved in this, and there's a number of presentations and discussions, and I don't need to raise it any further today. But we need a universe, unified voice. I can tell you now, being at a number of trade fairs around the world, it's very hard to promote an Australian brand when, when we have separate brands uh, being provided. You can't be talking about food safety and security and quality and assurance and, and uh, you know, paddock to plebate and, and have uh, completely disparate uh, branding capability. So if Austrade was to ask for one thing from the industry, we'd be really keen uh, to have a unified brand and a unified voice in the way we present that. We know that's an issue for the industry and we look forward to uh, helping you or contributing in whatever way we can for you to resolve that. Having said that, there are two major trends we're seeing. One revolves around discretionary consumer demand, lifestyle, and the other one is around food security, uh, living. The opportunity is to become an aspirational <coughs> choice uh, for fresh and packaged food. In other words, we want people to want cold stream wine from the Yarra Valley or Wagyu beef from New South Wales, from the Hunter Valley. We want them to think about that particular brand. It has to be that. It can't be something else. They want, we want a Chinese consumer to aspire to buy that particular product with that brand, and nothing can be substituted for that. To do that, we need to use premium positioning. If you saw our market share, we're never actually going to be a food bowl. We all know that. So therefore, we can, only, uh, we can operate highly effectively in the premium area. And of course, the leverage that we want to provide is the leverage around safety and the integrity of our food systems. We know uh, in, uh, in infant formula and, uh, and in milk, it's clearly a showstopper where there's any change whatsoever in safety and integrity. That's just one example. We've had our own example recently with, uh, with packaged raspberries. So this is clearly a key factor for us to be able to you know, get this message out. But actually, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, at the moment, we're packaged too cheaply for the price point. In other words, if you want to sell something at a higher price, it has to look like it's worth the higher price. Actually, recently I was at the Australian Automotive Aftermarket Show, and uh, one of the winners of the innovations was something they called a triple clutch plate. Who, who knew? Uh, and it's just a big, uh, uh, a big disc. But you know, it, uh, they presented it in, in uh, one of those uh, like camera cases. It was like, it was a beautiful thing, you know, I mean, it was to go in a car and it's a clutch bait. But the way they presented it matched their price point, <laughs> is actually the point I'm making. You thought you were paying $2,500 for that clutch bait, that looked like value in the way that they packaged it. We are very slow to innovate uh, and respond to trends, particularly in the Asian market. Uh, a big issue we've seen consistently is we're not consistently available. We're not always responsive to distributors' requirements. If we saw one complaint throughout our region and certainly in other markets is an inconsistency in supply. Of course, there's e-commerce. We're under-promoted. We're not tailored to the local tastes and we're inconsistent, confusing branding as I indicated before. So that sounds like a lot of things to do that in order for us to catch up. Of course, some products and capabilities are doing that, but we're not doing that on a universal basis. So it's pretty simple. Uh, in order to meet the challenge, we need to deliver what our Asian or Indo-Pacific customers want, and we need to tell a compelling food story, which I'm sure you're all aware of. The second trend is around food security or food for living. Of course, we're a diverse producer, but we're only a small exporter. As I indicated, we all know that we won't be a food bowl. We can only be a food supplier. If Indonesia changes its requirement of beef from 5 kilograms per person to 20 kilograms per person, I understand there's enough beef in the world to actually meet that requirement. So if there isn't enough beef in the world to actually meet the requirement for meat in Indonesia, then, then what, what market are we going to go for? And, and what are we actually going to provide and do? And I think that this is something we need to be clear on. 
So let's talk a little bit about that. We know that uh, global per head hectare uh, capability uh, needs to increase significantly. The other interesting point around this is that, as you probably know in this audience, there are very few areas in the world where there are significant uh, acreages of uh, arable land with water that can actually be highly productive. There's, there's only three or four places in the world where this can actually occur. Uh, and, and we have one of those regions in northern Australia, but it's a challenge. So, but in terms of actually creating productivity, we need to look at new ways on a per acre point of view to become even more productive. So that, we know that that's one of the challenges. But there are also different markets and different approaches to markets and new markets and different drivers. So one of my favourite expressions is, I always say there's only two markets in the world, there's China and there's not China. And, uh, and that's pretty simple. China is everything that we understand it to be in, in terms of demand. But it's not the only market. Uh, if we look at our export uh, volumes and dollars here for the Middle East and North Africa, you can see that last year, that's not to say that's going to be true of this year or next year, but last year the export volumes are roughly the same for the Middle East as they were for China. So it's not only the China market, there are other markets as well. Interestingly, a lot of that uh, new uh, volumes going into the Middle East is actually going in the carriages of those aircraft, 150 direct flights from Australia a week uh, going into the Middle East. So that's a new route to market. Uh, that's only been going since 2013, providing product directly into the market you know, in, within 24 hours. The other thing, of course, is that the not China markets, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Indonesia, Middle East, have other drivers. They can see that all the demand that's going towards China is sucking capability out of their markets. So if you are talking to customers in those markets, they're very concerned about reliability of supply. Uh, they want they want the right product, they want, uh, they want a nutritious product, they want a reliability supply and they want a safe product. So when you're talking to customers from those markets, their motivations are quite different. They just don't want to be subject to a price point or a volume point from the China market. They actually want to develop a long-term relationship. So the not China markets are as important and potentially more relevant to, to Australian farmers than the China market. It's not to say that China is important, of course it is. The other important point about this is quite often we don't talk about fodder. There's no way that the Chinese are going to continue to consume the amount of pork they're consuming in their domestic market without fodder. Uh, and the other interesting point about fodder is that fodder consumes four times as much water as cereal. And so that in itself creates an issue. So if you want to eat more white meat, uh, then you're going to have to provide more animal fodder. And you know that already there's been complaints from the US about selling alfalfa into China, because essentially why? It's about energy and water. So one of the clear drivers for the Maritime Silk Road, one of the clear requirements for building food supply relationships with Australia and with Latin America, is not just about food. We know that 23,000 river systems in China are poisoned. We know that up to 40% of their aquifers and, uh, and water systems are degraded, if not degraded completely. And we also know that because of the use of the pesticides and capability, up to 40% of their land has been also degraded for production purposes. They've doubled their production in food, but they've poisoned a greater percentage of the land at the same time. You've got the Gobi Desert coming from the north, and you've got the Himalayas locking them in from the south. In other words, the Maritime Silk Road and these other routes that are being opened up for them, including Australia and Northern Australia and, and Brazil, are actually providing them the opportunities not just to import food, but also to import water and energy used in the production of that food so that they can retain their water and energy for strategic purposes. So there's a different motivation. So if you're producing a food that is for life or for lifestyle, and that is packaged and presented properly and, and creates that market interest, but it also happens to be one that consumes a lot of water and or energy, then in quadrant terms, you go to the top right-hand corner of the quadrant in terms of price. You, you don't even have to be a price taker anymore. You're the price setter because you're delivering two components or three components to the production of that food, apart from the food itself and the taste that that market otherwise can't provide. This is a very important consideration uh, going forward. And you've seen there, when we're talking about the amount of uh, water that's consumed. 
for beef or for chicken. It's part of the, uh, the reasons that chicken is such a popular uh, meat over others is because it basically uses less water. So what don't we have from an Australia view? When we look at other markets where we, where we travel, in Brazil and Argentina and other markets like that, industrial scale. And what I mean by this is whatever we're thinking as farmers or farm groups, whatever we're thinking, quadruple it. Whatever you're thinking, then quadruple it and double it again. Because even if you quadruple it and double it again, we're still only going to be a food supplier. We're not going to be a food bowl. So in other words, the size that we require to grow to meet any of this demand in China or in not China markets is so big that we need to think about how we actually scale to provide this. We need more infrastructure. We know that. You're all aware of that. We need uh, more assistance in green tape. We need investment in the billions, and Australia is running forums at the end of the year in Northern Australia and around Australia to assist in that, and we need a unified brand. But what do we have? Well, the beautiful thing in any market is we don't have to create demand. There's more demand here than we could ever hope for. There's more demand than we could ever meet. That's a really positive thing. If we're out there trying to create demand for our product, that would be a problem. But we don't have that problem, so that's a good thing. We've got great science and we've got great innovation in farming. We've got Australia's north. For all of its challenges, it still represents land and water and acreage that other markets don't have. Singapore doesn't have that capability. And we've got huge amounts of buyer and investor interest. So they're really good things to have that can position us for the market. And the other thing is that we can build relationships. We can think about not just whether we're providing a product, but are we also providing all the other things that go with that? Technology, skills. Senator Colbeck's going to be here uh, this evening. He was on the mission with us to India, and he participated in the agricultural technology and science uh, services uh, mission that we ran. And, uh, and that was about Indian cows uh, improving their, uh, their yield from, uh, from five <coughs> litres uh, per day, five gallons per day, now remember, to, to 20. And, uh, and it was seen that Australia could actually help them produce that capability. So in other words, it's not just about producing a product or selling a product, it's also about selling a capability to help that domestic market grow their own capacity and capability. And, and that means that we can move from a relationship of just being a supplier to also being a trusted partner, particularly for those not China markets. So in closing, from an Australian point of view, what do we see? We really need more marketing science about what the different markets represent, Indonesia versus Saudi versus Korea versus China. What, what is it that makes them up, what's different, and what are their real drivers? Then we need to understand the customers within that, and what are their particular nuances, particularly if we want to sell packaged food, how should we package and present that? Uh, we certainly need to move our products more efficiently, and that requires infrastructure and capability. Doing that very well in the Middle East via the air hubs. We need to focus our, uh, our efforts where we match our advantages. Uh, we'd like to address the fragmentation, uh, especially in horticulture, but beef seems to be building quite well. And we'd like a really consistent story about our quality, our diversity, our safety and the integrity of our systems. That is a great capability. Uh, and, and something about us as a culture and as a society and how we as people and our lifestyles are packaged into those goods. Because that's partly what those people are buying. Just like we buy French cheeses or champagne, then we want our Asian buyers to be thinking about buying something Australian as they eat or consume that. And of course, we need to secure more investment to levels way beyond what we've been able to secure to date, and Australia is active in that. So thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the conference, and I hope that was uh, useful to you. Thank you.